Okay, so welcome back to the channel and today I'm talking about how luxury brands make money. Um, how I'm going to be doing this is I'm going to be reacting to an amazing documentary produced and directed by Gina and Jeremy Newson. Amazing, amazing documentary. It's called The Look, Scenting Money. Now the full documentary is very long, so I'm not gonna react to that. Um, but what I'm going to do is cut snippets of the documentary and kind of react to some key parts in the documentary. If you want to watch the full documentary, um, the person who produced and directed this has it on his YouTube channel. Um, so I'll leave the link to the full documentary in the description below. But anyway, let's get straight into the video. And if the consumer felt rich, it was nothing to how some designers felt. The turnovers of their fashion businesses could easily swallow up the gross national products of some third world countries. And what a handful take home in a year could wipe out national debts. The strange thing is, many of these clothes designers aren't making most of their money designing clothes. Real success in the fashion industry is predicated not so much on the brilliance of your cut as the brilliance of your marketing strategy. And frequently, that strategy centers on a word, a single name. And once you've made it, you can put it on anything. Underwear, cigarettes, deodorant, teddy bears, chess sets, tropical fruit. Oscar La Renta Papayas. They're really good, you should try them. They're really wonderful. Bath towels, ties, watches, sunglasses, cufflinks, biros. And it all goes back to one man, the man who became a label. Pierre Cardin made his name in the 60s with a bold line in space age inspired designs, saw the future, of his own name at least, and decided to lend it, or rather sell it dearly, to a stream of products, some 800 at last count, few of which he designed or has even seen. He is the richest designer in the world and he foresaw early on his greatest asset. My name? My name is protecting around the world for 110 uh, country. But a name is like any other product, you have to make it before you can sell it. Mio nome è mio, privato, mi ha fatto mia madre, mio padre. Private, maybe, but Giorgio Armani is now the name on a $1.5 billion turnover fashion empire. Emperor Armani, the man who trained to be a doctor but couldn't stand the sight of blood. So why I actually thought it was important that I reacted to this amazing documentary was because it highlights the importance of accessories and perfumes and fragrances and stuff like that to luxury brands and to the business models of luxury brands because it's a thing where I always mention it, but I never really had time to articulate why and to bring the facts. Um, and seeing this documentary, it's articulated in such a way that people can understand. Um, so that's why I just thought this documentary was really amazing to react to. There are other aspects to businesses like diffusion lines and licensing, which we'll get into later, but it's sort of like a game that designers play they kind of become big, they kind of become established names, and then they sort of use their je ne sais quoi of their name to sell anything. So once they become an established name and their name becomes synonymous with luxury and exclusivity and aspiration and high taste, then they can sell furniture and put their name on it and people associate it with some higher artistic value and they can just start making crazy profit margins on like everything. So it's really kind of like a game um, that people and businesses play. And that's why in this documentary, they started talking about Armani because Armani is a perfect example of someone who has successfully made diffusion lines and people buy into the diffusion lines because they can't afford the main line, like 1000 pounds for a suit. Not many people can afford that, but they can feel like they're part of that Armani group and that crowd by wearing sort of an Armani exchange t-shirt and things like that and they still feel like they're wearing something aspirational. But part of the game that is being played is that at the highest level of these brands, the clothing does have to be inaccessible because if nothing's aspirational, then their whole business model does not work. In a designer label obsessed age, Armani will go down in history as the man who power dressed a whole new post-war baby boom generation which had entered the workplace. But however minimalist the Armani look may be, the price isn't. The 
thousand pounds for a suit, eight thousand pounds for a beaded evening jacket. So how many people can actually afford to sport the Armani label stitched elegantly in white on black on the Giorgio Armani via Borgen Movo label? And so how big can your business possibly be? Being a rich designer doesn't mean designing for a few rich clients. Hence, insight number two. La gente si è molto mescolata adesso, il ricco, il povero, alla fine le vacanze sono vacanze per tutti, si può tutti andare a Mustica a fare le vacanze. Una volta era soltanto i ricchi signori, adesso anche la mia piccola segretaria fa la settimana alle Maldive. Quindi il mondo è cambiato moltissimo e questo bisogna tenerne conto. And the world is full of potential customers. Being a very rich designer means shifting millions of units in a mass market. For Armani, the name of the game is diffusion. Add a cheaper line to your mainstream collection, same classy name, much bigger market. Armani, the master of diffusion, took the black label from the thousand pound garment, now with all its aspirational associations, and in a typically minimalist stroke, changed it subtly and attached it to a 500 pound jacket. So now more people could buy into the essential Armani lifestyle at half the price. So perfect, it's a great thing that uh, they just brought up diffusion lines and I have a lot to say about diffusion lines. Now a big thing in business that is common knowledge is mass marketing. And it's all about the larger your consumer base is and the customer base, the more money a company makes. That's why companies that are able to sell things to the largest customer base, whether we're talking about Microsoft or Apple or Walmart, these are massive companies because their consumer base is really, really broad. Now, as a company, when you niche, when you go a bit too niche, you can still have a viable business and you can have a successful business, but it won't ever have that potential of growing to like a billion dollars and more than that. And so as a company, you want to figure out ways of making sure that you can create a product that can reach as many consumers as possible and as many customers as possible. So they start niche and they use the notoriety that comes with being sort of a respected designer as a launch pad to then open a diffusion line that has a wider customer base and then they can sell more garments. And the biggest thing about having a diffusion line and appealing to a wider customer base is your profit margins go through the roof. And the reason for this is basically economies of scale. Um, as you make more and more of the same products, the raw materials on a cost per unit basis become cheaper. And therefore they're making even better profit margins as the diffusion line grows essentially. But anyway, moving on, moving on. Still too much? For a tenth of the price, you can still have the privilege of bearing that priceless Armani label on your clothes. Insight number three, conquer the world. Having diffused the look across social and economic barriers, break the geographical barrier. Make the Armani label an international language of designer understatement, understood by the upwardly mobile shopping in one of hundreds of coolly lit, architecturally disciplined boutiques from Milan to Tokyo, from London to Honolulu. Of course, the worldwide clientele still has to be pretty solvent to sport the Armani emblem, even on the cheapest Armani jacket. Unless some manufacturer of mass market goods is willing to pay a fee to stamp Armani's name on their quite ordinary products, thus transforming them into talismans of good taste. It's a process called licensing, and when it works, it's a license to print money. Polo by Ralph Lauren for men. Calvin Klein. From Nina Rich. John and Karen, New York. I think it's the perfect marriage. Yves Saint Laurent. The designers invest in nothing. This is the big benefit for them. They don't have to buy factories, they don't have to buy production plant, um, they don't have to bear the brunt of advertising costs. And of course, they get the benefit of any advertising that's done with using their name because they get the rub off their own collections. So for them, it's an entree to big markets, mass consumer markets, that would otherwise require serious money to buy your way into. And for the manufacturer, they get the kudos of the designer's name and all the momentum and all the publicity that it's attracted. So in a way, they're defraying their marketing costs. It's a very cheap, easy route for them into what can be a very profitable market. So this is the best money maker of them all, licensing, this is what brings in the big bucks for luxury brands and big famous designers. Now, to explain what licensing is in fashion, 
Licensing is basically just the company paying for the right to use someone's name. Um, so for me to give you a certain example, um, so how a licensing deal would work in fashion is say, um, I don't know, Dior wants to make sunglasses. Now Dior does not have a specialty or expertise in sunglasses. They make clothing, they have ateliers for clothing. They don't have like factories for sunglasses. So what they do is a sunglasses company will either reach out to them or they'll reach out to the company that makes sunglasses and then they'll be like, okay, if you pay us a percentage of all of your sales, or it could be, it depends on what you agree really. Some people agree to flat fees, which is more what sort of like smaller designers do because they're just scared of the risk. Big designers know it's gonna sell regardless. So instead of getting a flat fee, they're not gonna do that because they're gonna make more money if they just get like a percentage of the earnings or the profits. Um, so that's also what happens. And then that licensing company, or in this example that I've given you, the sunglasses manufacturer, will then take that person's name, start making sunglasses, selling it under that person's name, and then just giving a percentage or flat fee to, to whoever the licensee is, whatever they've agreed. And every time, or most times, if they've done their business right, the company that paid for the license will make so much profit that it offsets the amount of money that they're giving to the licensee. Now for brands and designers, they benefit so much from licensing because they don't really have to do anything in terms of specifically on that what's going on with the license. Now, the whole reason why they were even able to license their name in the first place is because they're working hard in the fashion industry. But once you license your name out to some sunglasses company, it's not like you have to then oversee what's going on. You just give them a few rules and then they take those rules or the design, how you want it to look and they take those and sell it using your name. And you also benefit from the marketing because those sunglasses companies want to sell those products. So they're gonna pay for marketing campaigns and all of those things that you're not paying for. So essentially it's almost like free marketing as well that you don't have to pay for where, where through some luxury sunglasses ad that was paid for by the people who you licensed your name to, people might then find your products, like your clothing, which is money that is directly going to you. Um, so it works in so many ways for big companies and designers. And for this reason, it means that it's also low financial risk. So it isn't of a high financial risk to a lot of designers because of this reason, like you're not really, there's nothing to lose. If you sign a licensing deal, they are obligated to pay you. So if you agree a flat fee, whether that company fails to sell, most times if you've agreed to a flat fee, then you just get paid your flat fee. Or if you're supposed to get a percentage of the profits, well, if they don't make any profit, it's not like you lose anything. And to go deeper into this, I'm sure a lot of people watching this channel would have heard about this, but this is why a lot of companies, their sunglasses and a lot of their accessories are made in the same factory. So you would have heard things like, I don't know, H&M and Dior and all these different brands, they all make sunglasses in the same factory. Now, the reason for that is most times, one like sunglasses manufacturer will have licensing deals with so many different companies and names and it's one manufacturer so everything's going to be manufactured in that same factory and that's why most times there isn't really a quality difference or noticeable quality difference between a lot of like cheap sunglasses and expensive sunglasses by price when it comes to like the ones that are licensed really what you're paying for is purely sunglasses that have a designer name. However, there are some issues that people have to look out for before doing a licensing deal. There's so many things that can go wrong. Um, it can tarnish your name. And this can happen because there can be serious quality control issues. And how this would normally go is because at the end of the day, when you sign a licensing deal, yes, you've given this company and this manufacturer instructions that you want them to follow, but you're not. it's not internal, it's an external company. So you can't actually man manage everything that's going on in every single process. So a lot of the times there are QC issues and then their quality control is just a bit terrible. And then consumers have these really awful products and then they associate it with just the name. When meanwhile, these sunglasses probably had absolutely nothing to do with the brand that you're like, 
I don't like this brand anymore because I bought these sunglasses from this brand and the quality and the build was so terrible and it was so cheap. But it's actually quite funny because those sunglasses literally have nothing to do with that luxury brand. It's literally just been licensed out to like an external company and that external company hasn't done their due diligence. So designers and companies need to be really careful with who they license with to make sure that this is not an issue and they they only license out to companies that have a good reputation. And of course the worst drawback is oversaturation. If you license your brand to too many places, too many factories, too many manufacturers, then it's just everywhere. And in fashion, high-end fashion and luxury fashion especially, is all about aspiration. It's all about exclusivity. The reason why people buy designer perfume is because they're aspiring to be like a part of the type of people that can afford the expensive garment. So if something becomes a thing that everyone can buy, it's no longer really aspirational because everyone else has it. And therefore that's why these companies have to play the game. And really it's all about meeting this perfect balance between maximizing your profit by making it accessible to as many people as possible within reason of it not being oversaturated, which is a lot easier said than done. It's a really, really difficult thing to actually achieve. I mean, we've got such a property now, as far as Vivian is concerned, especially with getting the award. Vivian Westwood made her name, but not her fortune, as the visionary of alternative styles, widely imitated. Now her marketing team is determined to capitalise on her name. You have to really look at the what the value of that award really is. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, they don't give you a hundred grand every time you get the award. You know, you get a piece of metal and it goes in your shop window or whatever and that's it. What you actually, the kudos or whatever, or if you like, the stamp of approval that that brings with it in terms of your key to enter the doors of industry and finance. I mean, in terms of, is the bank manager more liable to hand out um, larger overdrafts because we got the award? Probably not in the end, not in this kind of climate. And is the, the, the industry in terms of manufacturing more likely to want to take you on? Probably not. They still yeah. think that it's all quite cottage potato printing stuff. We all know that it's like the age of packaging and the manipulation of money. I don't subscribe to that. I'm, I believe in quality rather than quantity and therefore it's the quality of the experience that's important. Now then, having said that, I am a fashion designer and I couldn't do what I do with regard to fashion if I didn't have some intellectual framework that's interesting me, some topic or other. It's worth persevering. The money-making potential of licensing is the golden bauble for every designer. But for the marketing team, it's a balancing act between exposure, building the name, and overexposure, cheapening it. Cindy was an interesting area we got involved in, uh, the life-size doll, because of, what was she, 30 years old this year? Ten years ago, Vivian Westwood, OBE, designed a punk outfit for a Cindy doll. Tonight, she designed a pink anniversary outfit for Cindy's corporate night out. Why do it? No, but Cindy is a fashionable little doll. <laughs> Yeah, she's got a bicycle like I have, I don't know. The subversive visionary meets big business. For designer of the year and giant toy manufacturer Hambro, there's a joint objective, market share. Whether it's dolls or dresses, the fundamental marketing equation is the same, brand awareness. Bags, baubles, scarves or belts create a demand and supply it with an endless stream of products. That's the picture from Vogue, isn't it? Right. Come on, but... Jeez, that's excellent, isn't it? But it's really great because they've got the whole look there. They've got the bag accessory from the, the um, license in Italy. They've got the jewellery. They've got the course. They've got the whole thing. But there's one thing they haven't got yet, and it's the holy grail of product licensing, perfume. OK, so now they've basically touched on what I said earlier about this sort of balance between overexposure and just being saturated. So they essentially just said what I said earlier, which is good, um, talking about how you have to strike the balance between not trying to be too oversaturated but being popular enough to where you can sell enough or being part of a wide consumer base to where a company can make a lot of money. And like I said, this is something that is extremely hard to achieve on a consistent basis. It's funny because people have this stereotype of like luxury brands like Louis Vuitton or Christian Dior. Um, they think that it's just you know, rich people that are really snobbish, which is part of the industry. 
but you know LA jet set girls were like oh my god I want to like go to the Louis Vuitton store and spend like ten thousand dollars like that's kind of the perception that people have of the fashion industry which is quite funny because someone like me who works in the industry all I know is just sitting beside people and working overtime and people sitting on laptops crunching the numbers and making sure the accounts and the numbers make sense and everything's right and then the last job that i did in fashion i worked in the marketing department and we literally had we crunched the numbers for everything like how deeply fashion brands plan this stuff is crazy like every shoot we did every piece of content we even posted even on social media platforms we thought about, okay, what is the what is our customer base of this brand? How does this picture translate to this customer base? How does this relate to this customer base? How is, and we're just crunching all these different numbers. What is the age demographic of people that watch this sort of stuff or consume this type of content? How can we create this content in a way that interlocks with the brand message and the brand ethos? and yeah it's just endless but anyway i'm really curious to see what they're gonna say about perfume because i feel like everyone that watches this channel is very aware that most luxury brands make most of their money from accessories and perfume especially perfume like perfume's a big one and perfume licensing is a huge thing in the fashion industry and makes luxury brands insane amounts of money so i'm really curious to see what they say about perfume licensing and the profit margins and how much these luxury brands actually benefit from these licensing deals. Well, I've obviously started to smell a few things. They're like, um, I don't know, a vulture or whatever. I mean, like somebody like me is the thing that they fasten on to because what they want to do is sit and talk to me, give me all these things to smell, get my reactions. And what they hope to do is to build up my portrait in terms of smell. A portrait in smell? You wear it, it comes in liquid form from the chemist shop. Worldwide, the perfume market is worth an irresistible $7.5 billion. Are these designers with perfume lines on the side, or in fact, perfumiers masquerading as designers? The exclusive couture collections of some top fashion houses, Dior, Chanel, Yves Saint Laurent, lose money every season. Where each outfit costing £30,000 may only be bought by six women around the world, it's virtually impossible to turn a profit. So why do they keep doing it? Every season, the fashion media descends on Paris to cover the couture collections, which, through their often breathtaking gaudiness, generate pages and pages of free publicity, keeping the big names constantly in the public eye. They're at the glamorous top end of a marketing pyramid. Couture is the lost leader, perfume is pure profit. When the house of Chanel was in trouble, wild man Karl Lagerfeld was brought in to up the profile. The clothes may be unwearable, but perfume sales have gone up. Over 70 years ago, Coco Chanel had the marketing insight of the 20th century. Her name was portable. It could sell anything. The first designer perfume was born. History doesn't relate what numbers one through four smelt like, but number five became the most successful perfume in history. What Coco Chanel realized was that perfume is a cheap entry into the designer lifestyle, an affordable luxury. Only a handful can buy $1,000 frocks, but it seems millions will spend $62 on a 7 ml bottle of liquid, the same price per ounce as 22 karat gold, especially if it makes them feel like a million dollars. Chanel number no. 5 has made hundreds of millions of dollars profit, the breakdown is simple. Ingredients, $3. Packaging, $6. Advertising, $8. Administration, $8. Profit for Chanel, $7.75. Total trade price, $33. Then a 60% retail markup plus tax brings it to $62. Dozens of names followed in Chanel's wake. Calvin Klein. From Nina Ritchie. Yves Saint Laurent. Julio Iglesias? Just about everyone with a name, designer or not, it seems, got in on the act in the 80s and had a nose paint their portrait in scent. Where are they now, these unforgettable fragrances? There are up to 120 new perfume launches per year and a proportionate number of failures. After three years, only one in five new perfumes is still on the shelves. I think it's all marketing. <laughs>
And there lies the perfume conundrum. Reducing the risk of failure involves risking even more money. Thus, the small players get priced out. Chanel, the brand leader, must spend millions on ads like this to maintain its share of the market. At the recent launch of Dune at the Chateau de Vaux le Vicomte outside Paris, Dior flew in 1,100 aristocrats, wearing Dior, of course, and celebrities in Dior from all over the world. Cost, $1 million. With so much at stake, fragrance has fallen into the hands of multinational conglomerates, who alone can afford the astronomical launch costs. Christian Dior is owned by the luxury goods conglomerate Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, which specializes in upmarket brand names and is itself an amalgam of famous names. The perfume formula is simple, fame first, then fragrance. And I hate to say it once again, but it is just a game that we all play. Because like they said, Couture is a money loser. It's something that loses money for a luxury brand. However, Couture is like the height of fashion design and fashion design skill and it shows an immense level of craftsmanship and that is sort of related to exclusivity once again and skill and luxury and craftsmanship and it in a business sense it adds to sort of the mystique of a brand and then it puts the brand on an upper echelon because obviously there aren't that many couturiers all they do is just leverage this sort of perception that they have of being about craftsmanship and being a, of the height of fashion design and then just make license loads of perfumes and sunglasses essentially and just make tons of money and I think the biggest insight for me about perfume I didn't really know too much about perfume till I met one of my friends um, at my last university so for guys that don't know uh, my first degree was in chemical engineering and when you study chemical engineering like we we were in the same building as people that studied civil engineering, electronic engineering, chemistry. Um, so one of my friends who I met who studies chemistry, he now works in a chemical com company. Obviously, I'm not going to say which one. And they work with some luxury brands to make their perfume. So he's like a chemist, basically. And it's so funny, like he gets so frustrated by luxury brands because he works for these companies so he knows like the cost of each raw material like how much oud is how much vanilla is per like 100 mil or however they measure it and he's like how can this company he'll look at the ingredients of like a luxury perfume bottle and be like how can this company charge 100 pounds for this bottle when all i can see are like cheap these cheap ingredients they're not even natural ingredients they're not natural scent and all that stuff and it's just insane like hearing his insight and I had no idea before like meeting him of the different raw material costs and how much of a profit margin uh, these fashion companies make because there are some perfumers who are more targeted towards people that actually care about perfume and they use the highest grade materials and raw materials and natural materials that um, are do well with the skin whereas a lot of luxury brands use cheaper uh, materials so they can increase their profit margins and they increase the price and they dilute the more expensive raw materials um, which is just insane and what designers normally do is they have sort of a concept or an idea and they kind of show this idea through the packaging of the perfume and then the perfumer has to kind of like take whatever the idea is and try to recreate it into sort of a fragrance. So the selling point, and this is also talking to my friend, the chemist friend, it's quite an interesting thing because everything that someone would want in a perfume is not necessarily what they consider. They're just considering kind of how they view fashion as how these luxury brands view perfume. They think of it as like, it has to have a narrative and an idea and we're going to add a reference to it so it seems like artistic or whatever. But really, as a customer, you want perfume that lasts long, it smells good and has some sort of projection to it. Whereas fashion brands are just like, we want this smell to exemplify a certain idea or mood. So it's kind of like there's this sort of conflict of interest, which is quite interesting. But in a nutshell, when these luxury brands get a fragrance, that has mass appeal, whether we're talking about Chanel number no. five or Dior Sauvage, 
It is a huge money maker. They are literally printing banknotes. But yeah, comment your thoughts down below. I'm very, very fascinated just by business and fashion, the business side of fashion, even though I also have an interest in the more artistic side of fashion. I think I can be interested in both. Um, I should probably be a fashion consultant. See, this is why I'm poor. Like, I need to work in parts of the industry that I'm actually good at. Um, but anyway, like I said, comment your thoughts down below. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to support the channel financially, then you can subscribe to the Patreon and get extra content through that. The link to that will be in the description below. And on that note, I'll be back with another video very soon.